So tonight, when Jesus calls, like, I started to think about how many times we get those phone calls, and Tom and I were talking about, you know, family members and people that call, and how often we, we send people to voicemail, or how often we, you know, are, are looking at who's calling, and who's, whose call are we going to take, and whose call are we not going to take, and, and how often do we, do we do that to Jesus, when Jesus calls, right? When we feel that call from the Holy Spirit, calling us to do something, calling us to, to, to act, how often do we send Jesus right to, to voicemail? How often do we say we're too busy and, and we, just don't, we just don't have time, right? So tonight is not necessarily going to be a teaching that is on men's and women's roles. We're not really going to look at marriage in a whole. But what I want us to do together is to think about the topic in light of our marriage, in light of our walk with Christ individually and together with our spouse. Because when we are one flesh, right, we are... Um, when we get in these calls by the Lord, a lot of times it's with our spouse and, and, and we are called to, to answer that together. So we're going to look at a few different situations, a few different scenarios, uh, a few different stories, I guess uh, you would say out of the Bible. We're going we're gonna to look at what happened and, and who did it and what the results were from it and, and what they did. So we're going to start with the, with the first disciples. We're going to look at Simon uh, who's known as Peter, right? Uh, his brother Andrew and, and James and John. And we're going to bounce between two accounts here. So if you want to put your finger into, in Luke 5 and Matthew 4, we're going to read from both texts here and we're going to kind of tie them together to get a, a real full picture of the story. Because Luke, he, he, does a, he does a great job of telling a good overview of this story. Right? We get, we get a, a larger picture of what happened and what went on. And then when we look at, at Matthew's account, we bounce back to that. We're going to see a little bit of detail on what these, uh, what these first disciples, what their, what their response was here. So we're going to start in Matthew. And we're just going to read in, in chapter 4, verse 18 to start off here. And it says, Now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. So you have Jesus walking by here and, and, and having his encounter uh, started here with uh, Simon and his brother Andrew. And we're going to flip over to, uh, to Luke 5 here, and we're going to pick up the story here. In, in verses 3 through 9. And it says, As he got into one of the boats, Jesus right, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. So Jesus walking by, right, he sees them. He gets into the boat, they put out a little bit, and he begins teaching the people on the shore from, from that boat. It says, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. Right? We worked hard all night and we caught nothing. He started to make excuses right away. How often when Jesus calls us, do we start to make excuses right away? Right? I'm tired. I'm I'm too tired. I've got a lot going on. I, I know, Jesus, you're calling me to do this, but I've got to take the kids to practice. I just got home from work. I've got a big project going on, right? You, you've got Simon and Andrew doing a similar thing here, right? We've been out all night. We're exhausted, Lord. You've, you have no idea, right? You don't, you don't know what we've been doing. You don't know how many times we have cast these nets out and we caught nothing, Right? Like, I, I know you're telling us to put them in the water, but, but I'm telling you nothing's going to happen. We've been doing this literally all night. So he goes on and he says, But I will do as you say and let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat, for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that when they began to so that they began to sink. 
But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of the fish which they had taken. If they hadn't put those nets down, right, if he, if he hadn't listened to Jesus, he wouldn't have seen this, this great catch, right? This, this almost like mini miracle, I guess, right? They, they put it out and they bring in more fish than they ever had, right, in, the, in this catch. We flip back to Matthew. So Matthew 4, we continue the story again here in verse 19. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Verse 20, immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets and he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. Right? They were called, and immediately they left. And I know a lot of times that, that we probably think we're getting a call from, from Jesus. He wants us to do something, right? We're, we're feeling that tug by the Holy Spirit, right? And, and what, is our, what is our response a lot of times? Like, we, we need to think it over, right? We need... Let, let, me, let, let me pray on this for another three months, six months, right? Let, just, let, me, let me see if it was for real. Send me, send me another sign, something concrete that I'm going to know that this is really what you want me to do, right? A lot of times, I think we even, we, we even turned it into an interview almost with Jesus, right? We, we, we set the chair up, right, for Jesus. You can sit there. I'm going to stand over here. I got my pen, right? And we're going to say, okay, I think, I think you're wanting me to do this, right? Like, you're giving me this call, but, but tell me here. We got our pen out and our paper. How much time is this going to take out of our life, right? Like, how, how much time? What am I going to have to really commit to here for this? Is there a financial cost, right? What are people going to think of me? And we start to interview Jesus, we start to interview the Lord on the call that he has put on our life. And that's not the example we see here with these guys. It says that they were called and immediately they left the boat and they followed him. Right? They knew he was Lord. They knew that there was something about him. And he called and they knew it. And immediately they went on mission with him. Right? They didn't turn it into an interview it's, it's never a bad thing to pray about things and, and sometimes that's what we're called to do and sometimes God just wants us to trust in him and to act, right? Now this is not the first time we see somebody follow the Lord's call or the Lord's command immediately. We're going to go all the way back to the beginning here. Genesis 22, verses 1 through 3. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I tell you. I think for most of us in the room at one point or another, maybe even today, that we probably just bent over and drew a line in the sand, right? It's okay to send us. It's maybe okay to send our wife, send some people. It's okay to make a call on our life, but not my kids, right? Got Abraham being called, right, to take, most of us probably know this story, right, to take his son, Isaac, up onto the mountain to be a sacrifice for the Lord. Right? How, how real does that get, that line there, when, when, when God asks you to trust him and go over that? In verse 3 it says, So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. He didn't need three months to pray about it. He didn't need a week to think about it. He didn't need a sign from the Lord. He didn't wait three or four days. He arose early 
the next morning and he followed God's command. He answered and reacted immediately. I wonder how many of us in this room have been putting off on on some of God's calls on our life, on our marriage, right? Who did he call earlier today? I wonder who might he be calling right now? I'm a planner, guys. I don't know about you guys. Like, this is not something that's easy for me. I, I make lists in my head. I do pros and cons. I do pluses and minuses. I will even write them out on paper, right? A lot of times we'll sit down with a pen and a paper and, and, and do the, the good and, and the bad. And I calculate things, right? Statistics, stuff like that. I, I'm in sales and, and a numbers guy. But I don't see in either of these stories that happened. What I see is true believers, faithful to the Lord, willing to move and willing to go and trust the Lord when he calls. Saying, here I am, God, send me. Right? And not just send me, but I'll go immediately. I'll follow you anywhere and I'll follow you now. I'm not good enough, Lord, but I trust that you are. So what happens when, when we do this? What are, what are some of the results that we see when, when we're bold enough to, to follow the Lord in this way? I mean, we see a lot of different things, right? Like, people are going to see. People are going to notice. You have Zebedee, right? James and John's father. He surely took notice sitting in that boat when his sons got out to follow, to, you know, to follow Jesus, right? I'm sure he was kind of like, come on, guys, what are you, what are you guys doing here? You're going to leave me all alone, right? You got all the people on the shore, shore, they surely took notice. Who are these four guys, right? These two sets of brothers, right? That climbed out of their boats, left everything there, right? To follow Jesus. Your faith is not something that you can hide if it's real. Matthew 5, verse 14 It says, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Right? If we are a true believer in the Lord, people are going to see. Right? People are going to be curious. People might think that you're a little crazy at some times. I'm sure the first disciples got that often. Right? But we're not going to be able to hide it. If it's real, if it's true, a light, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Right? You are the light of the world. It can't be hidden. What else? So when Jesus calls and your faith is real and you are bold enough to answer, sometimes the Lord shows you something that only he is capable of doing, right? It's in those times, it's in those moments that that a lot of times we get to see the miraculous. We're going to turn a little bit further here in Matthew. Lots of Matthew tonight. Matthew 14. We are going to start in verse 22. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Sometimes it's going to be scary, right? Sometimes sometimes Jesus is going to make a call on your life, and it's going to be scary, right? They didn't recognize him right away walking on the water. And they were a little bit fearful, right? Sometimes it's going to be tough. Sometimes it's going to be uncomfortable, We're not always going to be in uh, the the comfort of a building like this, sitting around uh, with other like-minded believers. 
right? Sometimes it's scary. Sometimes it's, it's uncomfortable. What does Jesus say, right? Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid, right? And so what happens? Verse 28, Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus, right? So what happens? What happens if he, if he doesn't accept the call, right? So, you know, first off, you've got Peter there. You've got, you've got Peter asking him, right? Call me out. If this is really you, Lord, call me out. How many times do we pray for God to put us in a situation that we can be bold with the gospel, right? How often are we, are we asking, Lord, to put somebody in front of us that we can disciple? God, give me the strength to, um, to tell somebody about you, to do something for you, and then God does it, right? Just like he calls Peter. He says, okay, you, you called? Come on out. What if we don't have the courage Right, the faith to take that step. I think of, we used to have a boat, so I'm, I'm thinking, stand in the boat, okay, he calls you out, like, this is probably not like walking off a plank or something like that. Like, you have to step over the edge. It was dark. They were, they were in deep water. If anybody has ever been out on a, on a lake in deep, dark water, it's kind of scary sometimes. You, you can't see anything or that. Like, so he has to step over the edge, probably with all of his weight, onto the water. I mean, he probably, in his mind, he thought, I'm about to get wet, right? Does he take his sandals off? Does he not trust him? Thinking about, I'm going to be soaking wet here. But no, he trusts him, right? And he steps over the edge. And, it, and if he doesn't trust him, right, he, what, what happens? He never gets to see the miracle, Right? That miraculous moment doesn't happen. At least it doesn't happen for him. Maybe he gets to see it, but he doesn't get to be a part of it. Maybe somebody else in the boat, right, one of the other disciples, says, you know what? If you don't trust him enough, you don't have enough faith, then I'll do it, Lord. Send me. Right? Peter wouldn't have got to be a part of it, but somebody else might have. And that might happen to us sometimes too, right? When we call on the Lord and he puts that situation in front of us. Right, husbands, wives, together, you know, as a, as a as a married couple, opportunities to serve, opportunities to be bold for Him, and we're not willing to step over that ledge, right, and trust in Him completely. Somebody else behind us is going to do it. God's going to accomplish His mission, right, with with or without us. Are you bold enough to step over the edge and see the miracle? You know who else wouldn't have seen a miracle? It was Joshua. Joshua had, uh, had taken over for, uh, for Moses, you know, basically. And, and um, you have Israel at, at war here. Uh, you're, you're going through many battles and stuff. And we're going to look at Joshua 6, 1 through 5. The story of Jericho here. And it says, Now Jericho was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel. No one went out and no one came in. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and the valiant warriors. You shall march around the city, all the men of war circling the city once. You shall do so for six days. Also seven priests shall carry seven trumpets of ram's horns, before the ark, then on the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people will go up, every man straight ahead. Right? That would be like, you know, the, the, these guys would be think, gotta be thinking like, you are crazy. Like this is never going to happen, right? When, when, when Joshua, uh, you know, says this, this would be like me, right? Standing up here to you guys and being like, hey guys, put your coats on. We're going to stand up and we're going to come out here and we're going to walk around this building. We're going to turn and yell at it a lot and the building is going to collapse. You guys would be like, you're nuts. We'll stand up and put our coat on and we'll get in our car and go home, right? Because... <laughs> 
That's crazy, right? But they do it, right? They have faith in the Lord. They trust in the Lord. And in verse 20, it says, So the people shouted, and the priests blew the trumpets. And when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight ahead, and they took the city. Right? So what happens when Jesus calls? We get to see the miraculous, right? When you're willing to follow, right? When sometimes it sounds a little bit crazy and might seem a little bit even more than crazy, right? Those are the times when God does his greatest work. And a lot of times we get to see a little piece of that, right? God does the miraculous, right? We see in, in stories like Lazarus and uh, being raised from the dead and Moses you know, when the, when the Red Sea is split, you know, in those stories, we're told that God does the miraculous. Why? So that people will believe, right? People will see and people will believe. Testimonies are formed out of the miraculous, right? When we, we have the opportunity to stand in front of people boldly and tell them about the work that God has done in our life, about the marriages that have been saved, that have been pulled out of the grave, Right? The miraculous works that he's done, the souls that are saved. But none of this happens if you don't answer the call. Let's say I want to look at, at, at another scenario here. It happens sometimes. We don't, we don't tend to probably understand this one as much. We don't like it. In fact, I, I think it probably happens a lot more than sometimes. I, th- I think it happens quite often. You know, we don't tend to like or, or, or understand this one very much because we like results. I think we are a results-driven culture, uh, results-driven people, uh, especially here in, uh, in America, right? Like, uh, we, we like and have trained ourselves to be impatient people. We, we have Amazon and, and fast food and the internet and instant rice and seven-minute abs and all kinds of stuff like that, right? I don't know. But we, we like to do things and we like to see answers, you know, right away. Sometimes I, um, I, I think it is, you know, Kelly said this to me the other day, it's less about the result and more about the story, right? Sometimes about the mission that you are on and, and less about the result that comes from that. So if you're, if you're pursuing the Lord, if you're really following his calls, if you're really answering his call, you're going to see this happen quite a bit. God's going to call, and sometimes you're not going to know why, right? Sometimes you're not going to see the fruit of your labor. You're not going to get to see the result of it. You know, sometimes, sometimes not soon, and sometimes not ever. God tells, or we see this repeatedly in the Old Testament, right? We, we see different scenarios of this. Like God, God tells Abraham, his descendants will be more numerous than the stars. Genesis 15, 5. It says, And he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens. And count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. That didn't happen in Abraham's lifetime, right? He was faithful to the Lord, right? We we saw uh, just earlier, right, his story with Isaac. The next morning he arose, right? He didn't get to see that. In fact, in Genesis 26, you know, we have God telling Isaac, you know, like, I, Isaac didn't get to see it either. It still hadn't happened at, at, at that point in time. How about Noah? Right? Noah called to, to build the ark. Going to be the flood. Most scholars, we're not, we're not given a biblical timeline, um, but most scholars believe that it took him somewhere around 100 to 120 years to build the ark. I mean... That's a long time, right? I don't know about you guys. In the morning, I get impatient if I've got to watch the coffee brew for three minutes. 
We're talking about a hundred plus years of building an ark for a flood that, that didn't happen, you know, um, you know, within those first few years. I, 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 would, I don't know about you, but I mean, I, I would have been seriously questioning it after probably day five. Six months, three years, 10 years, 25 years. But he built it faithfully, right? He must have been like, seriously, God, like something. Like, can I, can I put this? I mean, this thing is the size of a football field, right? Like, what are we doing here? Right? How about Mary, Jesus' mother, right? Virgin birth, watching, uh, you know, Jesus and, uh, you know, the short time as ministry on earth. Getting to see miracles, a lot of awesome work done, but, you know, she also watched him, you know, suffer on, on the cross, right, for us. Didn't get to see the broad scale of his ministry and, and his work of the, of the church, Right? She didn't get to see the results of all that. I mean, she got to see some amazing things, but like on, on this kind of level, right? On this, on, the, on this broad level like we see it. Again, we, we don't have a timeline for her, but she probably only lived about 10 or 15 years after Jesus, most people believe. So she didn't get to see all of, all of his work play out afterward, right? <clears throat> she was faithful, right? And she didn't get to see the impact like we see it today. Hebrews 11.13 says, All these died in faith without receiving the promises. And referring to, to Noah and, and Abraham and others. You know, back around Thanksgiving, Kelly and I were being called on a, a kind of a crazy sounding mission uh, that, that, uh, that, that, we, uh, that we knew we had to go to. You know, it involved us changing our vacation plans. We were, we were headed to Florida, uh, headed down with the kids uh, for, for a little vacation and to uh, visit some family. And uh, we got a call from the Lord uh, a couple days before that. And trying to figure out what to do with it, how to be, how to be loyal to him in it. Uh, we set out on our way to Florida, driving, uh, driving down, which is awesome. 20 hours in the car, two kids, good times. So 20 hours in the car down. We stopped about a half an hour on the trip, headed south on 23, and, and we were at a rest area, and we talked about it, and we knew that uh, together that God was calling us a different direction. So we, we changed our plans, or God, or God did midstream, right? And, uh, and instead of heading south, we made a right turn, and we headed almost 30 hours in the car to Las Vegas. And we had, we had big hopes for this, right? Our, our own hopes in this. We thought, okay, we're going to go there and we are going to preach the gospel. We are going to pray, uh, you know, o- over this person. We are going to, you know, we're going we're to see God do something miraculous and hopefully this, this person will come with us. Right, and we 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 can take them back. We have, we have we have somewhere safe, you know, for for them to go, and uh, you know, kind of like a kind of like a, a rescue mission, you know. And really, really had all this in my own head of how this whole mission was going to go, how this whole story was going to go. God, we're we're faithful to you. We can get there quicker if we if we just drive and go right now, and and, and so that's what we did, and. You know, when we, when we got there, we got to share our faith, you know, with some, with some people. And we got to see God do some amazing things, you know, while we were there. Some puzzle pieces put together that we know only he could have been a part of. But what didn't happen is when we left there a couple of days later, we left with just the four of us that we came with. That person did not come with us and... Um, we didn't really get to pray much over them. We didn't get to preach the gospel. We didn't get to do all of these things that we really thought that we were going to be doing. And we, and we left there exhausted and drained mentally and physically and asking the question, why God? Like, what was this all about? And we drove 29 or 30 hours and, and we did this because this is what, you know, we know that you were calling us to. You know, why did you send us here? What were we doing 
You know, why all this time? Did we do something wrong? Did we miss something? You know, there, there must have been another reason for this. And, and we find ourselves uh, talking about this in the car a little bit as, as we were pulling out and in the hotel later on that, uh, um, you know, next couple of days as we drove from Vegas all the way to Florida from there. So we were in the car for uh, a few minutes uh, during that trip. But, um, you know, Kelly told me about a conversation about a new friend, you know, that we had, that we had made on, on the trip. And, and she was telling her, you know, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it was along the lines of don't lose hope, right? Don't stop doing good just because the outcome here wasn't the outcome that we had planned for, right? She said, and she used a word that I seldom thought of before this time. And she said, sometimes we just do it out of obedience. And that's it. Sometimes, maybe many times, Jesus is going to call. You are going to answer. You are going to follow. The mission might be big. The mission might be little. You're going to follow for reasons that you can't even explain. Sometimes Jesus is going to call and you're going to get to the end doing everything that he called you to do and in the end it was just about you being obedient. It's about trusting the Lord with all your heart. You know, in my head, I think in, the, in you know, it's a, it's, it, it's a scenario that I put in my head, I guess, after this, this scenario and, you know, maybe some others where you get in a situation like this. And, and I think about when I meet the Lord, right? Like that day that I get to stand in front of him and be like, will, will, will I remember to be like, God, what happened? Like we went to Vegas, we did this, we, we, we changed the plans around, right? Like we didn't see anything like what, what was the meaning in all that? Like what did, what did you have for that? Because we didn't see anything. And in my mind, I hope, I, you know, I, I hope the answer is something like, you know, God being like, Nick, I, I know you don't understand because my ways are, are bigger than your ways, right? I, I see things different than you. And, you know, maybe that he'll say something like, hey, you see, you see that guy over there or, or that, the, that girl over there, that couple, that family, you see those people over there? Well, you don't know them, right? No, no. And they don't know you, right? No, I don't think so. And I hope God says, you know what? They know me because you were obedient, Sometimes we're not going to get the answer, right? We're not going to get to see what it was. We're not going to get to know what it was all about. What is Jesus calling you to do today? 1 Corinthians 1.9 says, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. God is faithful, right? He's faithful to, to you, husband, to you, wife. He is faithful to you, married couple. If you are called to him, right? Called into fellowship with him. Called to go out and serve with him. He is faithful to you. Do you trust him fully as Lord and Savior? And that, that's the real question, right? Do we trust him Fully, And have we given our lives and our marriages over to him completely? Do we trust him like the first disciples did, right? Like, like Abraham did. And when God calls that he, or, or that we will be able to respond immediately for sure. Will we be bold enough? Will you guys be bold enough tonight to take that call? Would you guys bow your heads? Lord, we come to you tonight, Lord, giving uh, thanks to you. God, thanks for your, your work on the cross, Lord, for, for sending your son to us, Lord, for giving us a, a great example in, in the first disciples, God, for stories of Abraham and, and Joshua and uh, all these great followers of, of you, Lord, who could set an example so that we could know what to do when you call us. God, I pray that your spirit is filling us tonight, Lord, that we are able to be bold lights for you, right? That that, that we walk out of here so full of faith and trust in you that everyone we encounter uh, will 
will want to know what is different about us, what looks different about us. God, be with all the couples in here tonight. God, just watch over us as we talk in small groups. Be with the leaders. God, we just thank you for everything that you are, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.